the people who wrote the standards, maybe they weren't thinking about climate the way that they would if they were writing the standards today, because it was 30 years ago. But the, the way, the kind of farming that the standard really sought to, um, to enable is a type of farming that is good, not just for the farming ecosystem, but the ecosystem that the, the farm is part of and beyond that, right? It like, it's, it's all these different systems within systems. And if you've got a good, healthy farming system that cycles and um, isn't extractive, then that's going to benefit the systems that it's part of. And that includes the planet and that includes the climate. Welcome to The Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of The Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label, distinguishing organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture. You just heard from Charlotte Valais, who joined us a couple weeks ago on our podcast, where the two of us discussed her thoughts on the difference between regenerative agriculture and the organic movement. We had this conversation uh, late last summer, but today we're continuing our conversation with Charlotte, uh, this time in an interview with my co-director, Dave Chapman. If you haven't seen it yet, Charlotte is one of the stars in our 2023 virtual symposium at the Crossroads. Tickets are still available to watch the recordings. Uh, there we discuss the rise of the chemical no-till farming movement and its affiliation with the word regenerative. We interviewed about 50 thought leaders like Charlotte on this topic. So you can find tickets to the recordings at realorganicsymposium.org. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. And I'm talking today with Charlotte Valleys. Charlotte, <laughs> thank you. Um, we've known each other for a while now. Um, I first met you at a National Organic Standards Board meeting back in the day, and I've seen you at many meetings since then. So you've been a long time um, champion for organic integrity. And you, you, you were you know, with Cornucopia, and then you were with um, Orga uh, Consumer Union. Thank you for talking today. It's my pleasure. Um, you've also been pursuing an academic career. Could you talk about your graduate work? Because it's relevant to our conversation today. Yeah. Um, so in 2017, I was at Consumers Union and decided to um, go back to Tufts, to the Freedman School of Nutrition for a PhD. And um, so I've been pursuing a PhD in specifically agriculture, food and environment with um, I went through the qualifying exam, so really needed to know a lot about sustainable food systems because that's that's what the program focuses on. And then once I got through the qualifying exam for, so I became a doctoral candidate, then it was time for the dissertation and I decided to look into the question of regenerative agriculture and specifically how it relates to organic and the, um, the organic social movement. And, and how regenerative fits into that. That's wonderful. Um, it's so relevant. That's, that's what our symposium is about, actually. Um, did you go into it with a thesis? Uh, into the PhD program? Well, into, no. this, into, into, into the dissertation. Into the dissertation. Did you have uh, an idea that you were looking to prove or disprove? Um, I, I wanted to explore it and see where it, where it went. So definitely not a, you know, I'm trying to prove something kind of a dissertation more. I wanted to talk to people, interview people and really make sense of it because it was something I couldn't make sense of when I started, um, when I started thinking about what my topic would be, it just, you know, I felt like I needed I needed to talk to people and and get 
um, some some insight into why. Because for me, the big question is why. Why are so many people, especially young people, um, people who are new to this movement, why are they so excited about regenerative agriculture? And I felt like either did, did they not know that organic is a, that what they're talking about is organic. It already exists. I felt like people were either reinventing the wheel for reasons I didn't understand, or I thought maybe people weren't aware. I thought maybe they don't know that a hundred years ago, Albert Howard wrote about this stuff. And in the seventies, there were plenty of farmers who were putting those ideas and that philosophy into practice. Um, and then I thought people weren't aware that there's an organic standard, that there's already a label out there that, that really captures those things. Um, and it turned out that that wasn't the case. That was kind of the easy explanation. Um, but people are very much aware of organic. They, um, they don't see it as reinventing the wheel. They see regenerative as something, something different. So I wanted to really dig into what, what is that? Why, you know, why, and where's that coming from? Yeah. What year did you start to work on the thesis? Uh, 2021. Okay. Yeah. So a year ago. Yeah. I mean, a lot's happened even in a year, but uh, certainly a lot happened since uh, 2017 yes. on this. So, okay. So what are you learning? <laughs> <laughs> why, what, wh why do you think that people who are aware uh, that there is an organic movement, that there is even an organic standard, wh what are they looking for that they think they're not getting from organic? So the, I, I think there's a lot of things I, the big one is there that the biggest strength of organic, which is that standard, has turned into one of its weaknesses. And they're actually intentionally moving away from the standardization part of organic. That they know organic is a social movement to transform the food system. And it's a philosophy and it's, it's, um, it's also now a standard. And, and so I hear a lot of people talk, when they talk about regenerative, use words um, that are kind of dealing, or not use words, but they're, they're, they're actually looking for a word that can capture the concepts and the philosophy and the principles, but without being, without the constraints of a standard. So the standard has become something that they see as holding back the organic movement. And they're looking for a fresh start and, and a word that everybody can use without, um, without you know, the, the, the standard now makes it, in some cases, illegal, right? For somebody to say that they are an organic farmer if they're not meeting the standard. But there are plenty of farmers who who want to capture that concept of being organic without having to be certified either because they don't have the certification yet and they want to convey that they are headed in that direction. That's their, they share that mindset, but they don't have the certification. But then even farmers who have the certification, they want to set themselves apart from the baseline standard, uh, which is, as we know, it's, it's, it's seen by many people as a floor, even though we think of it as, um, or it, it is a floor actually, it's not the ceiling, right? And so they wanna, so they feel like they need a word to say, yeah, I'm organic and I grow in soil, I have my cows on pasture, I'm regenerative organic, to set themselves apart from, again, what is the, what, what came out of having a standard. Yeah, well, uh... I would say what came out of having a standard that's been really compromised. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing about being hydroponic or growing cows in confinement that is organic. That's just been a way of working the system to to tap into a great deal of uh, popular support for an alternative kind of agriculture. So you think that uh, a lot of people, especially young people, is that is that what you're finding in, in your research that it's it's young people are searching for something more than or the term organic to represent what they believe in? 
Yeah, I've, I've noticed it among younger people that they, um, they tend to I, associate organic with that standard with um, also it's, it's, it's a binary, right? You're certified or you're not. That's how they see it. They see it not so much as continuous improvement and, uh, and a social movement. They really associate it more with, because they grew up with organic being a label that you see in the store. Food is either organic or it's not has the seal or it doesn't. Um, and so when they get excited about these concepts of this alternative approach to agriculture, um, they're searching for a word that doesn't, that doesn't have a binary, you're, you're certified, you're not, you, you're in or you're out. Um, they want a word that captures that bigger concept. And I think that's why regenerative is, is so popular. Um, So that makes that makes sense, uh, certainly for somebody who is a farmer, and um, their farming is inclining in a certain direction, and maybe that term sums it up for them mm -hmm. as an eater. Right. Exactly. A little bit. Absolutely, and that's why the dissertation is not as simple as just you know. Here's the explanation because the food system has many people who are both farmers, eaters, people in between, food companies as well. Um, and, and so does it, what works for one segment doesn't necessarily work for another. And I think you're absolutely right that for eaters, that's where the standard is. Like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's its biggest strength, right? It's, it's truly that's what makes organic unique is that it has that standard and legal enforcement. Um, and from the consumer side, that's really critical. And so that's where I, th I think regenerative um, from the consumer side is, you know, that, that inclusive, everybody can be on the journey doesn't work if you're in, in a supermarket looking for assurance when you're shopping for food when you don't have that direct connection with the farmer. So that's where organic and having a standard is, is really important and really critical. So I'd, I'd like to go into what regenerative means, but first, could we just stop at what organic means? Um, and what does organic mean to you? And I, let, me, let me qualify that by saying, what does real organic mean to you? And I don't mean the name of an organization, what yeah, does, what's the concept? What does real organic mean? What does organic really mean to you? Yeah, to me, um, it's, it's farming in a way that harnesses and um, fosters ecological processes that works with nature rather than trying to overcome it. Um, it's, it's understanding that farms are part of bigger ecological, natural processes and systems. Um, and, and yeah, working with those processes and, and directing them, harnessing them to production of food um, rather than being, you know, the alternative is the extractive model and seeing the farm as a factory with inputs and um, inputs in and outputs out. It's uh, organic is about cycling cycling process, uh, ecological processes. So uh, it sounds to me like actually the law is pretty much in alignment with what you just said, the Organic Food Production Act, which was a fairly uh, enlightened law, mm -hmm. a, a miracle that it, it got passed. Do you think that that law is being followed in the National Organic Program. Do you think the words that you talked about, are, are they reflected in what is being certified as organic or are there problems there? Yeah, there are, there are problems and that again boils down to standardization. <clears throat> Can you take something as complex as organic farming and in order for there to be a standard that is enforceable, there has to be some kind of simplification and reductionism in order to create a standard. 
And I, I think that's the paradox of an organic standard is organic is inherently dealing with complex systems and complex systems inherently cannot be reduced down to one set of, of standards. And yet it had to be done in order for the consumer on the other end of that, you know, the, the food system to be able to have assurance. So the law is good and it's as good. I think it's as good as it could have been given that, given what it is, which is a reduction of a complex idea into uh, something that can be in, that could be enforced. Yeah. I think I became an organic farmer somewhere around 1980. It's a little hazy back there, but um, it was interesting when, when I was beginning, we, the young farmers and, and the people I knew were young, um, were having these conversations a lot of, well, what, what is organic? What, what should we, how should we farm? And most of those young people were not experienced farmers. Some were, um, but, uh, and there were, you know, we, I have friends in the Midwest and, and even in California who started life on a farm. They grew up on a farm and, but they were doing something different from their parents and it was quite apparent. And as we were doing these conversations, we actually started to evolve standards mm -hmm. and go, well, I don't think that that, that should be considered organic if we're trying to follow these principles that we get from the kind of books you're describing from Albert Howard and Eve Balfour and these uh, earlier pioneers. What, what does that look like? How do we build the actual alternative to that, that agricultural system that we want to actually have a choice about? When the USDA took over, something changed, it stopped being a conversation, is, is the way I felt about it. Mm. I'm curious, do you think it was a, a good idea to have the, uh, to create the National Organic Program? And, and did you at one point think it was good or bad and ha has your opinion changed over time? So a couple of thoughts on that first, that's the question I love to ask people who were there. In the 1980s, I was in elementary school in Belgium, <laughs> right? So I was completely clueless. Um, so I, I love asking that question. I mean, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, sure. on you know, do, was it the right thing? My take on it is if I were there in the 1980s and part of those conversations, I... I absolutely see why it would have felt like the right thing to do. And I, because you need, you need something that has teeth behind it to prevent just anybody from calling whatever they produce um, organic, right? You needed, you needed to have a baseline of this is um, the, the, these are the standards you need to meet in order to put it on a store shelf and get the premium for it. And um, so I, I think it was the right thing to do. And I think that with regenerative, that's what, that's the big question that's out there, right? Like if you're rejecting standardization, if that's partly why, you're excited about this term is that there's there's no standard behind it, that it is inclusive, anybody can call themselves regenerative and it's a journey. At some point, can that grow? Can you really transform the food system by, given that most of our food is sold in supermarkets and not direct from farmer to consumer. So at some point, will there need to be a standard for the regenerative that's not organic. So I'm not talking regenerative organic certified, there's already standards for that. Um, but the regenerative that's more of the big tent, the inclusive, you know, baby steps are, um, you know, that concept that even baby steps are a step in the right direction. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on 
you know, 1980s, do you regret it? Was it the right thing to do? Uh, my, my thoughts have changed a lot and several times. Uh, when the Organic Food Production Act was passed, when uh, the government created standards, um, I was opposed to that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a mistake. I was suspicious of the government. I didn't think they'd do it well. I thought what we were doing was working very well. Every, every region or state had their own standards, but the truth is there was very little difference between the standards. So Vermont and Maine and California had essentially the same standards for organic. We knew what they were and there were minor differences. So I felt that the difference would be that when the federal government got involved, we would lose control of those and they, they, might, get, they might get hijacked. Mm -hmm. And after um, some years, I, I said, I was wrong. Um, this has worked very well. The, the, I was still being certified by the same organization, Vermont Organic Farmers, that we had created before and that was certifying us, we were self-certifying. And everything was good. I agreed with their decisions. Um, the only thing that was interesting that changed is that we became more passive as a, as a community, mm -hmm. as a movement. We were more passive. It was somebody else set the standards. And there was this uh, advisory board, the National Organic Standards Board, but I didn't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about the National Organic Program. I knew that the USDA did not like us, had not liked us for a long time before the law. And I thought, well, they seem to have gotten over it because everything is working well. And then I stumbled into realizing, oh, it's not working well. We've got, we've got confinement livestock being certified, large confinement operations. It was even worse with poultry, mm -hmm. these huge, huge hen houses, yep. uh, totally confined. Uh, of course, hydroponic, that's how, that's how I entered the conversation. It's like, well, wait, we, we did get them to agree, you know, three years ago that this was not going to be allowed. Now it's being allowed. Somebody's made a mistake. And the grain fraud. So all these things were there. <coughs> and I realized that, that it was bad, that this thing that we had worked for, that, that we had had such success with, um, was really struggling. But you know, Michael Sly said to me, you know, we, we, tr we kept the government out when we created fair trade standards, and that didn't work either. That's right. That's right. And fair trade USA is, is not good, right? And it looks just the same. You can't tell them apart. And actually, the real cautionary tale is regenerative agriculture, where there's no government, well, there's plenty of government involvement, but there's, there was no government definition. Of, of what regenerative meant. There was no standard, no federal standard. And so it means whatever you want and the person with the biggest microphone wins. Right. And the person with the biggest microphone is Bear Monsanto and Syngenta, not, not mm -hmm. some Midwestern farmers. Right. Who, when they started it, it wasn't even meant to be something about consumers, eaters. It was meant to be about farmers, talking to farmers about how to farm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so... In the end of the day, I don't think that the problem is that the USDA got involved. I think that the problem is that it's very hard for us to have an honest conversation between farmers and eaters. Uh, there's just the biggest industry in the world mm -hmm. is, is how everybody in the world eats. Right. And, and, um, it's not a level playing field, and, and we're just going to have to fight for it. That's all. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. that, there's, there's my, my answer. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, I completely agree. I think that we've seen what happened with regenerative. Just, I mean, how quickly it happened, right? So, so quickly. I mean, like Bear Monsanto made their announcement just, I mean, it really kind of made it official in that way, you know, that now regenerative doesn't really mean much anymore. So could you explain that to people? Because a lot of people who will be coming to the symposium, actually, they really are coming as blank slate. They go, I don't know. 
what does regenerative mean? And um, so could you explain what it means that Bear Monsanto kind of took the helm? Uh, I mean, it, for them, obviously pesticides are part of the picture um, of regenerative. And it means that it's, it's been reduced down to the, the absolute bare minimum of doing something a little bit different um, and calling it regenerative. And in their case, it's, it's no-till plus a cover crop but you can still plant genetically engineered seed and that no-till, the cover crop termination, meaning at, you know, if you're a farmer, you, you plant a cover crop, meaning to keep the soil covered, maybe over winter, you know, build soil health. But when you, as a farmer, need to um, make room for growing the grain that you'll end up selling, the choices are you can till the field or you can um, you can just spray with herbicides to to kill the cover crop. And so the bare Monsanto version of regenerative is going to have room for that herbicide termination. And um, and so that's now when you ask people what is regenerative. Um, for some people, it is no till plus a cover crop and they say nothing about GMOs or herbicides or insecticides. Um, in, in animal agriculture, if that feed ends up feeding animals in confined animal feeding operations, those animals can be given antibiotics and growth hormones and they just don't go there. So it really is, you know, you just have such a wide spectrum now of what does regenerative mean. And with Bear Monsanto, their definition is um, really just a handful of practices yeah. that certainly don't change how that, you know, that don't change the, the farming landscape for the better. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the thing that makes me sad in all this, I mean, of, of course it makes me sad to see another term uh, degraded, but the thing that really makes me sad is to see that so much of uh, the community of people who supported organic are sort of turning away from it. And they're going, well, they till. They till the soil. And um, I was just at a farm and, and uh, they feel quite positive about their tillage practices. Mm -hmm. And they don't think there's anything wrong with it. They're careful, they're skillful in how they till. And it's become a bit of a religious thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's dogmatic. It's, it's very dogmatic. dogmatic. Yep. And, and it's a dogma that's being um, preached by a lot of people who don't really know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, they want the best of things. So, you know, we've got really positive intentions, but they've walked into a very complicated party and they... <laughs> they that's they true. They don't quite know what's going I, on. I think it's part of the just the this tendency of people to look for the silver bullet or just the one thing that um, like the one practice that 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 can explain everything. And and no till I think for some people has become that that one practice that's um, I mean think about Kiss the Ground, the documentary in that scene where um, the NRCS guy right. is in front of a group of farmers and he's got NASA um, atmosphere, just, you know, the globe and, and atmospheric CO2 levels. And he says, you know, well, I'll give the context, you know, and, and the CO2 levels globally rise in uh, late winter up until about May. That's when um, late May, early June, the CO2 levels start to go down again. And that is the earth taking a breath. The earth is a living organism. And, and every year it breathes in and then it breathes out. And so CO2 levels are highest in May, late May, because that's the point where in the Northern hemisphere, all of the leaves start, or the trees start to get their leaves back. So they start to breathe 
through photosynthesis and take all that CO2 out of the atmosphere and transform it into oxygen. That's why CO2 levels go up and reach their highest at the end of May. But what the NRCS a person did, and, and this was then in Kiss the Ground, was he said, that's because you're tilling. Mm -hmm. He told all these farmers, see that CO2? That's because you're tilling. All that CO2 is because of you and your tillage. And that's horrible because that's not true. <laughs> it's just not true. And, you know, and, and, and what is tillage, you know, what's what CO2 being released from soil? It's microbes breathing and being active. Um, so you can't reduce it down to CO2 and, and tillage. And that's another thing is that you know, people are just so focused on carbon and, 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 um, and using um, agriculture as a solution to climate change and really just, it's all about carbon. And it's, it's, again, much more complicated than that. It's about cycling. It's about, you know, the, the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, preserving the cycles and, and not extracting and wasting. That's what's throwing off the balance of or the earth, which is a living organism. Its systems are being thrown off balance because we're not using carbon and nitrogen in cycles the way that, that nature does. Um, we're extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere as nitrogen fertilizer, and then a lot of it gets wasted as nitrous oxide in the air, which is a greenhouse gas, or uh, you know it ends up in, in water as, and then leads to dead zones. So, you know, without going into the science too much, I think it's just, um, again, it, these things get reduced down and yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, Lindley, uh, well, uh, she educates me. She's, you know, got a lot more science than I do. But one of the things that she's pointed out, because we look at, at, some of the ways that people are trying to understand how to evaluate agriculture. Again, these are good, responsible people who are trying to um, make good choices. And uh, one of the things they're looking at is, well, you can get certified by so-and-so if you show an increase of organic matter in your soil, an increase of carbon. And of course, you know, CAFOs do fantastic on this because they've got all this manure, no place to put it because the f animal feed is coming from far away and they put it on the fields close and you test them and they have tremendous organic matter. But it's a complete distortion of uh, the actual impact of that farm on the climate and uh, on all other kinds of health as well. You know, the, the human health too, their, their products are not superior in nutrition. Right. So, again, we need to be uh, a little bit um, informed and, and thoughtful about these things. And it's hard because we're, we're all drowning in information. Mm -hmm. We get more things to read in a day than, you know, right. our parents got to read in a year. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, and I think with the, you know, that, that's another focus of the regenerative movement is, I often hear people say that they're practice agnostic, that it's really all about outcomes. And right, and if you measure the outcomes on the farm and the outcomes are improving over time, then that's regenerating, that's regenerative. But then the question is, what outcomes are you measuring, right? And that gets down to that reductionism. Are you reducing it down to one or two outcomes? And even if you're saying, no, I'm looking at the soil in a holistic way. I'm not just looking at soil organic matter, looking at all these different other outcomes in the soil. Um, then, you know, well, what about uh, water and what about human health and, and what about all these other outcomes? So can you really ever measure all of the outcomes? Uh, you, you can't, you know, like, what are you going to measure? And are there trade-offs? And usually there are, and that's why, again, I think organic is such a good standard because it, it captures that. And it's, um, you know, if you're measuring antibiotics in, in water, then organic will be good. And now even with PFAS, right, from sewage sludge, like there's always these new things that, that come up where 
people are like, oh shoot, we didn't think of that. <laughs> now we've got PFAS on our, on our land because we've allowed sewage sludge um, in conventional. And it's like, yeah, organic, organic thought of that. <laughs> we got that covered, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's not perfect. And that's the other thing is it's not perfect. And we, we can't, um, yeah, we, we, we can't kind of have this perf perfectionism and, 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 and if it's not perfect, then consider it not like throw the whole thing out, you know, which is what some people want to do. It's not perfect and it's pretty darn good. And it's the best we have. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had a conversation. Uh, I've had a couple conversations with Michael Pollan, but I had one uh, a year, a little over a year ago. And I was very surprised when he said, um, yeah, organic is great, but of course they left out the climate because nobody knew about the climate back then. Did organic leave, leave the climate out? Obviously, when Albert Howard was doing his research, it hadn't occurred to anybody that farming or, or anything else that we did in our life had such a significant impact on climate. We, we weren't yet aware of our power right. uh, for good and for ill. Mm -hmm. and, and but I wonder, when I look at organic farming, I go, well, yeah, that's about as good as we're going to get for the climate. Uh, well, I won't say it's as good as we're going to get, because I believe that organic should be evolving. Mm -hmm. And there are new questions all the time. It's not that it's static. Real organic is constantly evolving. It's just not constantly evolving to allow glyphosate. Right. And, and you know, those kind of practices. But do you think that uh, organic... Uh, left out the climate or or really missed the boat? I don't think so. No, I think organic intentionally became or, or, or was created as a process based practice based standard. And the practices were such that the whole system would benefit. It, it forced farmers to not use inputs and practices that we now know negatively impact the climate. We didn't know it, or we, again, I wasn't there, but you know, the, the people who wrote the standards, maybe they weren't thinking about climate the way that they would if they were writing the standards today, because it was 30 years ago. But the, the way, the kind of farming that the standard really sought to um, to enable is a type of farming that is good, not just for the farming ecosystem, but the ecosystem that the, the farm is part of and beyond that, right? It like, it's, it's all these different systems within systems. And if you've got a good, healthy farming system that cycles and um, isn't extractive, then that's going to benefit the systems that it's part of, and that includes the planet and that includes the climate. So what we're finding now is that in fact, the practices of organic farming practices are good for the climate. It is climate friendly farming. We didn't call it that 30 years ago when the standards were written, but, um, but that's the outcome. Maybe we could touch on the recent 2.8 billion dollars that the USDA has given away in order to support what they call climate smart or climate friendly agriculture. Yeah, climate smart commodities. Climate smart commodities. So um, the first time I heard that term climate smart agriculture, it, it was being promoted by Monsanto. And I was like, really? So I'm curious, do you think that they you're aware of, of the money and where it went. Where do you think about that? Did the, did the USDA make good choices with our money? Uh, the USDA made the choices I think we would expect the USDA to make. So um, some of that money went to very good um, programs that will do the right thing. And... Um, some of it didn't, <laughs> you know, some of it is certainly going to that no-till plus a cover crop equals uh, climate smart type of agriculture. 
that I don't think is, is the right approach. Um, 8% apparently went to organic, specific organic programs. I mean, and there's really good organizations that got a lot of money. Rodale Institute, Organic Valley for their carbon insetting. Um, you know, excellent programs that really got a huge boost with, you know, millions of dollars. And um, as a, but as a percentage, it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of money also going to a certain, a certain approach to climate smart, which I don't think is actually climate smart. Yeah. Have you, have you tracked the, the farm to fork initiative in the EU? I haven't, I, I'm aware of it, that they were trying to get 25% of their farmland organic, right? Is that the right number? 25% organic and a 50% reduction in agricultural chemicals. That's great. Pretty, Pretty bold. bold. Yeah. Pretty bold. And, um, you know, they, they passed, they passed it as a, as a, a goal, as a target. And, um, but at the same time, the USDA has come out virulently opposed to it. I mean, they're not fooling around. It's like, this is the devil. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, the devil is to increase organic and to cut back on the use of chemicals in agriculture. And that's one of the more discouraging things I've heard, actually, mm -hmm. um, that our representatives are doing everything they can to stop that from happening. And uh, I don't think they're worried about what's going to happen in the U.S., but they're definitely worried about what's going to happen in the rest of the world, mm -hmm. uh, in Africa and Asia and South America and Central America, and these places which are huge markets for American technology and American chemistry. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, it's barely, something that's barely talked about in this country that our huge partner in the world, the, the European Union, is choosing to take a very different path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's striking to see how, how they really do support what is, you know, the right kind of agriculture. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I want to see the whole, whole world become organic. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think? What what what's what's our best best path forward? Um, well, there there's a lot of consumers who still don't understand, um, or, or who who don't think about where their food comes from. That's the other thing I think we're dealing with is, you know, sometimes we talk about the organic movement and the farmers and the consumers, but that's really as a percentage of the American population still, it's not the majority, right? Most people don't really think about where their food comes from. Um, certainly don't see the connection between food, the food choices they make and the environment and the climate and, and workers and farmers. There's a lot of people who do, but more people who don't. So, um, so that, that's what, that's the other thing that makes, you know, having a label be what's, you know, it, it can't just be a label, this transformation of the food system, having a label that connects consumers and farmers doesn't deal with that whole other huge segment of the population that really doesn't think about that. And then there's all the people who, who do think about it, who are aware of it, who simply can't afford it who have to choose the lowest cost food. Um, and so I, it's, it's a big problem and it's not just, it's kind of a problem that goes beyond organic and the organic label. Yes. Well, they're, they're kind of two different problems. I mean, the problem of mm, what, what's, the, what's the given like the, the culture, what's the, our culture around food? What food do we choose to eat? How do we feel about it? How do we care about it? 
It's interesting. Dan Barber is very interesting because he, he feels we almost don't have a culture in America because we're an mm. am amalgam of so many different cultures mm. and we ended up with uh, pockets of all of those and which are fascinating and they enrich each other. But but also we've ended up with kind of a cult, corporate food culture, which is different. Um, the question of, of poverty is it's a, a universal problem. It's not about organic, of course. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's far beyond that. Michael suggested that actually cheap food is the band-aid on poverty to keep people from getting too angry and too discontented because people know that governments fall over hunger. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so the, the cheap food policy is to keep people from standing up and saying, I won't right. take it. Right. Yeah. Because at least... The well, answer, answer isn't necessarily cheaper food, but a higher minimum wage, for example, mm -hmm. so that people can make enough money to buy the food that they need to buy right. to be healthy. Well, and in rural communities, I... You know, I went to White Oak Pastures, which is fascinating too. You know, they're not certified organic, but they are organic. They could be if they wanted to, yeah. calling themselves regenerative. But the point is just the transformation of that little town in rural Georgia, one of the poorest counties in America, where the industrialized agriculture system had devastated that, that town. And, and now with really one farm and slaughterhouse and, and now all of the, the on-site processing that's happening as well, just how many jobs were created mm -hmm. and those people are being paid a living wage. And, and now, you know, that, that, that gets that cycle back functioning again, that, that it, local economy where now they can afford if they want to, if they choose to, to, to buy good food and pay a little more for it. But it's that, you know, it's the chicken and the egg. It has to get rolling. Um, and so we, we need to see more. And that's what I love about what Will Harris said. You know, it's, it's not about scaling. It's about replicating. Like we need more of, we need to replicate these kinds of farms. You know, real organic farms everywhere. And smaller and more labor intensive isn't a bad thing. It's just, you know, we, we were so... It, this whole idea of efficiency that they're not as efficient and and they can't create the cheap food as if that's a good thing as if like kicking people off the land and replacing them with machines is a good thing and it's not right right um so we just yeah need to see more of these farms everywhere you know the idea that you talked about um kind of healing the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle and seeing that in, in organic agriculture, these cycles are protected and encouraged to really operate well. Well, there's a financial cycle, mm -hmm. a money cycle that also needs to be protected. Yeah. And um, when things are cycling and moving in a healthy way, it's a very Chinese medicine understanding of health in our body that when the energy channels are open and things are moving through, it's not about having more. It's just about them moving. So using it. Yeah. And that's why this whole, I mean, bringing it back to tillage and the no-till movement of storing carbon and even carbon sequestration, that idea of carbon sequestration is a good one. Yes, we need to get CO2 out of the atmosphere, bring those levels back to where they need to be. And more carbon in the soil is one way to do that. But when it's just about carbon sequestration and when people focus on that as if carbon needs to be stored and put away rather than cycled, and that's where sometimes with organic farmers who till as part of cycling carbon, growing biomass and then tilling it into the soil, they're cycling the carbon. And they're not. their goal isn't to store it and keep it there. It's Right? It's, it's using it. It's using the carbon. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's actually, that's fascinating, right? Our financial system is the same. We've gotten so focused on taking it, taking it from one place and putting it in a concentrated, concentrating all that wealth somewhere where it's really all about, you got to cycle it. Yeah. 
again, it's almost a religious belief that it's good to concentrate it. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't actually think it holds up very well in reality that it's good. No. It, it's not good for most people. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, Charlotte, there's some things I know we should be talking about that we haven't touched. Are there things that you would like to bring up to talk about? Um, you've done an awful lot of work um, trying to understand the regenerative agriculture and organic. So you were, you, were, you were an organic champion for years before you got into this dissertation. Mm -hmm. um, you have a unique perspective. Are there things that you would like to mention or suggest to people that they might think about? Uh, I, I think it's, you know, what the, the message I really want to get out is, yeah, organic has its problems, but organic is also really worth fighting for, you know, and I'll, I'll keep fighting for it. I don't think, um, I don't think we need an alternative. I don't think we need to just move, move away to something new, reinvent the wheel. I think organic is, is a really good, strong standard. And today, really the best way if you're a consumer, unless you have access to a farmer and you can buy direct and you know that farmer, organic is the label to look for. And I think, um, I'm going to keep fighting for it and, and, uh, yeah, and it's not easy, but I think it's worth it. <laughs> you know, you know how I think of it is, um, it's like traffic lights, you know, traffic lights, some people run red lights and it causes accidents, but do you say that traffic lights don't work? You should just get rid of them. That, that's how I see organic. It's better than it's the system is in place. And yes, there's problems with it. But at the end of the day, it's better to have the traffic lights there. Um, because at least, yeah, it's better than nothing, right? Yeah. So something that uh, I get asked a lot from people is, well, what can I do? You know, uh, we we are this this strange organism of billions of people and individuals. And we see that our impact as a group is very powerful. And we see that our impact alone has a lot of power for a few people. What, what would you say to somebody who says, okay, I get it. I get it. We need to protect organic, but what can I do? How do I, what, what should I do? So if the person gets it, then I, then I think definitely get to the story behind organic, then take that next step and, um, find out the farm that, um, that you're supporting the company you're supporting and, and do, do, do a little bit more research, um, and support the, the add on labels, like, real organic project and um that's that's the next step to then make sure that you are as an individual supporting the farmers that that you want to support and that's why i think cornucopia scorecards are so valuable right it's for those consumers who um who, who do want to take that 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 next step but i think the danger is that there are so many people out there who need to get to buying organic and understand the value that that has, that that is meaningful as well. Um, so it depends on, on the person. All right. Charlotte, thank you very much. It was great, great to talk with you today. I'm really glad we got to do this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Real Organic Podcast. We hope that you'll subscribe and share a link with your friends. Please take the time today to leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to right now so that others can find us. A video version of this interview is found at realorganicproject.org and by following our YouTube channel. 
Please join us next time when we'll hear from longtime organic farmer, Elliot Coleman, to learn more about his position on tillage and the rise of the word regenerative. And please remember that it's not too late to watch the replay link from our 2023 virtual symposium. You can learn more at realorganicsymposium.org. See you next time. Thank you.